Tom? No answer. Tom? No answer. What's gone with that boy, I wonder? You, Tom! The old lady pulled her spectacles down and looked over them. Then she put them up and looked under them. She seldom or never looked through them, for they were, well, they're really her state pair. And they were built for style, not service. She could have seen through a pair of stove lids just as well. She looked perplexed a moment and said, Well, I lay if I get hold of you, I'll... By this time, she was bending down and punching under the bed with the broom, but she resurrected nothing but the cat. I never did see the beat of that boy. She went to the open door and looked out. No Tom. So she lifted up her voice and shouted, You, Tom! There was a slight noise behind her, and she turned just in time to seize a small boy by his jacket. There, there, I might have thought of that cupboard. What have you been doing in there? Nothing. Nothing? Look at your hands and look at your mouth. What is that truck? I don't know, Aunt. Well, I know. It's jam. That's what it is. Forty times I said if you didn't let that jam alone, I'd skin you. Hand me that switch. The switch hovered in the air. The peril was desperate. My, look behind you, Aunt. The old lady whirled around and the lad fled on the instant, scrambled up the high board fence and disappeared. His Aunt Polly stood surprised a moment and then she broke into a gentle laugh. Oh, hang the boy, can't I never learn anything? Ain't he played me tricks enough like that for me to be looking out for him by this time? But old fools is the biggest fools there is, I guess. He'll play hooky this afternoon. I'll just be obliged to make him work tomorrow to punish him. Mighty hard to make him work Saturdays when all the boys is having a holiday, but I gotta do something. Gotta do some of my duty by him, or I'll be the ruination of the child. Tom strode down the street, whistling with a peculiar bird like turn, a sort of a liquid warble. Presently, Tom checked his whistle. A stranger was before him. A boy, oh, a shade larger than himself. And this boy was well dressed, too. Well-dressed on a weekday? <laughs> this was simply astounding. His close-buttoned blue cloth jacket was new and natty. He had shoes on, yet it was only Friday. He even wore a necktie. He had a citified air about him that just ate into Tom's vitals. The more Tom stared at the splendid marble, the higher he turned up his nose at this finery, and the shabbier and shabbier his own outfit seemed to grow. Neither boy spoke. They kept face to face and eye to eye all the time. Finally, Tom said, I can lick you. I'd like to see you try it. Well, I can do it. No, you can't either. Yes, I can. An uncomfortable pause followed. Then Tom said, Oh, you think you're mighty smart, don't you? I could lick you with one hand tied behind me if I wanted to. Well, why don't you do it? You say you can do it. Well, I will if you fool with me. Oh, take a walk. Say, if you give me much more of your sass, I'll take and bounce a rock off on your head. Well, why don't you do it then? What do you keep saying you will for? Tom drew a line in the dust with his big toe. I dare you to step over that, and I'll lick you till you can't stand up. The new boy stepped over promptly. Well, you said you'd do it. Why don't you do it? By jingles for two cents, I will do it. Well, the new boy took two broad coppers out of his pocket and held them out with derision. Tom struck them to the ground. In an instant, both boys were rolling and tumbling in the dirt, gripped together like cats. And for the space of a minute, they tugged and tore at each other's hair and clothes, punched and scratched each other's noses and covered themselves with dust and glory. Presently, through the fog of battle, Tom appeared, seated to stride the new boy and pounding him with his fists. All enough, said he. The boy only struggled to free himself. He was crying, but mainly from rage. And the pounding went on. At last the stranger got out of smothered enough. And Tom let him up and said, Now, that'll learn you. You better look out who you're fooling with next time. The new boy went off, brushing the dust from his clothes, snuffling and occasionally looking back and shaking his head, and threatening what he'd do to Tom the next time he caught him out. <laughs> to which Tom responded with jeers. 
He got home pretty late that night, and when he climbed cautiously in at the window, he uncovered an ambush in the person of his aunt. And when she saw the state his clothes were in, her resolution to turn his Saturday holiday into captivity at hard labor became adamantine in its firmness. Saturday morning was come, and all the summer world was bright and fresh, brimming with life. Cardiff Hill beyond the village and above it was green with vegetation, and it lay just far enough away to seem a delectable land, dreamy, reposeful, and inviting. Tom appeared on the sidewalk with a bucket of whitewash and a long-handled brush. He surveyed the fence and a deep melancholy settled down upon his spirit. Thirty yards of board fence, nine feet high. Sighing, he dipped his brush and passed it along the topmost plank, repeated the operation, did it again, compared the insignificant whitewashed streak with the far-reaching continent of unwhitewashed fence, and sat down on the tree box, discouraged. Oh, he began to think of the fun he'd planned for his day, and his sorrows multiplied. Soon the free boys would become tripping along, and they'd make a world of fun of him for having to work. And the very thought of it burned him like fire. He got out all his worldly wealth, and he examined it. Bits of toys, marbles, and trash. Enough to buy an exchange of work, maybe, but not enough to buy so much as half an hour of pure freedom. At this dark and hopeless moment, an inspiration burst upon him. A great, magnificent inspiration. He took up his brush and went tranquilly to work. Ben Rogers hove in sight presently. The very boy of all boys whose ridicule he had been dreading. Ben was eating an apple and giving a long, melodious whoop at intervals, followed by a deep-toned ding-dong-ding, for he was impersonating a steamboat, the big Missouri, and he considered himself to be drawing nine feet of water. He was boat and captain and engine bells combined, standing on his own hurricane deck, giving the orders and executing them. Stop her, sir. Ling-a-ling-a-ling. The headway ran almost out, and he drew up slowly toward the sidewalk. Stand by that stage now. Let her go. Done with the engine, sir. Ling-a-ling-a-ling. Tom went on whitewashing, paid no attention to the steamer. Ben stared a moment. Hi. You're up a stump, ain't you? No answer. Tom surveyed his last touch with the eye of an artist. And then he gave his brush another gentle sweep and surveyed the result as before. Ben ranged up alongside him, and Tom stuck to his work. Hello, old chap. You got work to do, huh? Well, it's you, Ben. I wasn't noticing. Say, I'm going in the swimming. I am. Don't you wish you could? Of course, you'd rather work, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Tom contemplated the boy a bit. What do you call work? Why, ain't that work? Tom resumed his whitewashing and answered carelessly, Well, well, maybe it is and maybe it ain't. All I know is it, it suits Tom Sawyer. Oh, come on now. You don't mean to let on that you like it. The brush continued to move. Like it? Well, I don't see why I oughtn't to like it. Does the boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? Now, that puts the thing in a new light. Ben stopped nibbling his apple. Tom swept his brush daintily back and forth, stepped back once more to note the effect. Ben watching every move and getting more and more interested and uh, more and more absorbed. Say, Tom, uh, let me whitewash a little. Tom considered, was about to consent, but he altered his mind. No, no, I reckon it wouldn't hardly do, Ben. You see, Aunt Polly's awful particular about this fence, right here on the street, you know. 
I reckon there ain't one bow in a thousand, maybe two thousand that can do it the way it's got to be done. No, is that so? Oh, come now. Let me just try only just a little. I'd let you if you was me, Tom. Ben, I'd like to, honest engine, but if you was to tackle this fence and anything was to happen to it... Oh, shucks, I'll be just as careful. Now, uh, let me try. Say, I'll, I'll give you my apple. Tom gave up the brush with reluctance in his face, but alacrity in his heart. And while the late steamer Big Missouri worked and sweated in the sun, the retired artist sat on a barrel in the shade close by, tangled his legs, munched his apple, and planned the slaughter of more innocents. And there was no lack of material. Boys happened along every little while, and while they came to jeer, but remained to whitewash. By the time Ben was fagged out, Tom had traded the next chance to Billy Fisher for a kite <laughs> in good repair. And when he played out, Johnny Miller bought in for a dead rat and a string to swing it on. And so on and so on, hour after hour. And when the middle of the afternoon came, well, Tom was literally rolling in wealth. He had 12 marbles, part of a Jew's harp, a piece of a blue bottle glass, a spool cannon, a key, a fragment of chalk, a glass stopper of a decanter, a tin soldier, a couple of tadpoles, six firecrackers, a kitten with only one eye, a brass doorknob, and a dog collar. And he had had a nice, good, idle time all the while. Plenty of company, and the fence had three coats of whitewash on it. If he hadn't run out of whitewash, he would have bankrupted every boy in the village. Tom said to himself, well, not such a hollow world after all. He had discovered a great law of human action. Namely, that in order to make a man or a boy covet a thing, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. So now Tom presented himself before Aunt Polly, who was sitting by an open window. She thought that Tom had deserted long ago, and she wondered to see him place himself in her power again in this intrepid way. May I go out and play now, Aunt? What? Already? How much have you done? It's all done, Aunt. Tom, don't you lie to me now. I can't bear it. I ain't, Aunt. It's all done. Aunt Polly went out to see for herself. And when she found the entire fence whitewashed, and not only whitewashed, but elaborately coated and recoated, and even a streak added to the ground, her astonishment was almost unspeakable. Well, I never. There's no getting around it. You can work when you're a mind to, Tom, but it's powerful seldom you're a mind to, I'm bound to say. Well, go along and play, but mind you get back sometime in a week or I'll tan you. She was so overcome by the splendor of his achievement that she selected a choice apple, and she delivered it to him. Along with an improving lecture upon the added value, a treat took to itself when it came without sin and through virtuous effort. And while she closed with a happy scriptural flourish, he hooked a donut and skipped out. As he was passing by the house where Jeff Thatcher lived, he saw a new girl in the garden. A lovely little blue-eyed creature with yellow hair plaited into two long tails and a white summer frock. A certain Amy Lawrence vanished immediately out of Tom's heart and left not even a memory of herself behind, like a casual stranger whose visit is done. He worshipped this new girl with a furtive eye, and when he saw that she had noticed him, why, Tom pretended that he didn't know she was present, and he began to show off in order to win her admiration. By and by, while he was in the midst of some dangerous gymnastic performances, he glanced aside, and he saw that the little girl was wending towards the house. Tom came up to the fence and leaned on it. She halted a moment on the steps and then moved toward the door. Tom heaved a great sigh as she put her foot on the threshold, but his face lit up right away for her. She tossed a pansy over the fence the moment before she disappeared. The boy ran around and stopped within a foot or two of the flower and then shaded his eyes with his hands and began to look down street as if he discovered something of interest going on in that direction. 
Presently, he picked up a straw and began to, well, try to balance it on his nose with his head tilted far back. And as he moved from side to side in his efforts, he edged nearer and nearer toward the pansy. Finally, his bare foot rested upon it. His pliant toes closed upon it, and he hopped away with his treasure and disappeared around the corner. But only for a minute, only while he could button the flower inside his jacket. He returned now, and he hung about the fence till nightfall, showing off as before. But the girl never exhibited herself again, though Tom comforted himself a little with the hope that, well, she had been near some window meantime and been aware of his attentions. Finally, he went home reluctantly with his poor head full of visions. Monday morning found Tom Sawyer miserable. Well, Monday morning always found him so because it began another week's slow suffering in school. After breakfast, as Tom slowly wended his way into captivity, he came upon the juvenile pariah of the village, Huckleberry Finn, son of the town drunkard. Huckleberry was cordially hated and dreaded by all of the mothers of the town because he was idle. He was lawless and vulgar, and because all their children admired him so, and wished they dared be like him. Tom was like the rest of the respectable boys in that he envied Huckleberry, his gaudy, outcast condition, and was under strict orders not to play with him. So he played with him every time he got a chance. Huckleberry was always dressed in the cast-off clothes of full-grown men, and they were in perennial bloom and fluttering with rags. His hat was a vast ruin with a wide crescent lopped out of its brim. His coat, when he wore one, hung nearly to his heels. His baggy trousers were supported by one suspender. The fringed legs dragged in the dirt were not rolled up. Huckleberry came and went at his own free will. He slept on doorsteps in fine weather and in empty hogsheads in wet. He didn't have to go to school or to church or call any being master. He could go fishing or swimming when and where he chose. Nobody forbade him to fight. He could sit up as late as he pleased. He could swear wonderfully. In a word, everything that goes to make life precious, that boy had. So thought every harassed, hampered, respectable boy in St. Petersburg. Tom hailed the romantic outcast. Hello, Huckleberry. Hello yourself and see how you like it. What's that you got? That's a dead cat. Let me see him, Huck. My, he's pretty stiff. Where'd you get him? Oh, I bought him off in the boy. What'd you give? I gave a blue ticket and a bladder that I got at the slaughterhouse. Say, what, what is, what's dead cats good for, Huck? Good for? Why, cure warts with Oh, say, how do you cure them with dead cats? Why, you take your cat and you go out and get in the graveyard long about midnight when somebody that was wicked has been buried. And when it's midnight, a devil will come, or maybe two or three. But you can't see him. You can only hear something like the wind. And when they're taking that feller away, you heave your cat after him and say, Devil follow corpse, cat follow devil, warts follow cat, I'm done with you. That'll fetch any war. Sounds right. Say, Hucky, when are you going to try the cat? Tonight. I reckon they'll come after old Hoss Williams tonight. But they buried him Saturday, Huck. Didn't the devils get him Saturday night? <laughs> How you talk. How could their chimes work till midnight and then it's Sunday? Devils don't slosh around much of a Sunday, I don't reckon. Well, I never thought of that. That's so... Let me go with you. Of course you can, if you ain't afeard. Afeard? <laughs> it ain't likely. Will you meow? Yes, and you meow back now if you get a chance. Last time you kept me a meowing around till old Hayes went to throwing rocks at me and saying, Darn that cat! So I hove a brick through his window. But don't you tell. I won't. But I couldn't meow much that night because Aunt Polly was watching me, but I'll meow this time. Then the boys separated, and when Tom reached the little isolated frame schoolhouse, 
He strode in briskly with the manner of one who had come with all honest speed. The master, throned on high in his great split bottom armchair, was dozing, lulled by the drowsy hum of study. The interruption roused him. Thomas Sawyer, now, sir, why are you late again as usual? Tom was about to take refuge in a lie when he saw two long tails of yellow hair hanging down a back that he recognized. And beside her was the only vacant place on the girl's side of the schoolhouse. He instantly said, I stopped to talk with Huckleberry Finn. The master's pulse stood still, and he stared helplessly. The buzz of study seized. The pupils wondered if this foolhardy boy had lost his mind, and the master said, You? You did what? Stopped to talk with Huckleberry Finn. There was no mistake in the words. Thomas Sawyer, this is the most astounding confession I have ever listened to. Take off your jacket. The master's arm performed until it was tired, and then the order followed. Now, now, sir, go and sit with the girls, and let this be a warning to you. The titter that rippled around the room appeared to abash the boy. But in reality, that result was caused rather more by his awe of his unknown idol and the pleasure that lay in his high good fortune. He sat down upon the end of the pine bench, and the girl hitched herself away from him with a toss of her head. Nudges and winks and whispers traversed the room, but Tom sat still, with his arms along the long, low desk before him and seemed to study his book. By and by, the accustomed school murmur rose upon the dull air once more, and presently the boy began to steal furtive glances at the girl. She observed it, made a mouth at him, and gave him the back of her head for the space of a minute. When she cautiously faced around again, a peach lay before her. She thrust it away, Tom gently put it back, and then she let it remain. Tom scrawled on his slate, Please take it. I got more. The girl glanced at the words but made no sign. And now the boy began to draw something on the slate, hiding his work with his left hand. For a time, the girl refused to notice, but her curiosity presently began to manifest itself by hardly perceptible signs. The boy worked on. The girl made a sort of a non-committal attempt to see. At last she gave in and hesitatingly whispered, Let me see it. Tom uncovered a dismal caricature of a house with two gable ends and a corkscrew of smoke issuing from the chimney. Then the girl's interest began to fasten itself upon the work, and she forgot everything else. When it was finished, she gazed a moment, and then she whispered, It's nice. Make a man. Well, the artist erected a man in the front yard that resembled a derrick. He could have stepped over the house, but the girl was satisfied with the monster and whispered, It's a beautiful man. Now make me coming along. Tom drew an hourglass with a full moon and straw limbs to it and armed the spreading fingers with a portentous fan. The girl said, Oh, it's ever so nice. I wish I could draw. It's easy, whispered Tom. I'll learn you. Well, will you when? At noon? Good, that's a go. What's your name? Becky Thatcher. What's yours? Oh, I know. It's Thomas Sawyer. <laughs> that's the name they licked me by. You call me Tom, will you? Yes. Just at this juncture, the boy felt a slow, fateful grip closing on his ear and a steady lifting impulse. In that vice, he was borne across the house and deposited in his own seat under a peppering fire of giggles from the whole school. And then the master stood over him during a few awful moments and finally moved away to his throne without saying a word. But although Tom's ear tingled, his heart was jubilant. <laughs> When school broke up at noon, Tom flew to Becky Thatcher and whispered in her ear, Make out you're going home, and when you get to the corner, give the rest of them the slip and come back. I'll go the other way. In a little while, the two met at the bottom of the lane, and when they reached the school, they had it all to themselves. Then they sat together with the slate before them, and Tom gave Becky the pencil and held her hand in his, guiding it, 
and so created another surprising house. When the interest in art began to wane, the two fell to talking. Tom was swimming in bliss. He said, do you love rats? Oh, no, I hate them. Well, I do, too, live ones, but I mean dead ones. To swing around your head with a string. <laughs> no, I don't care for rats. What I like is chewing gum. Oh, I should say so. I wished I had some now. Do you? I got some. I'll let you chew it a while, but you must give it back to me. Well, that was agreeable, so they chewed it, turned about, and dangled their legs against the bench in an excess of contentment. Was you ever at a circus, asked Tom? Yes, and my pa's going to take me again sometime if I'm good. Oh, I've been to circus three or four times, lots of times. I'm going to be a clown in the circus when I grow up. Oh, are you? Gee, that would be nice. They're so lovely, all spotted up. Yes, that's so. And they get slathers of money. Most a dollar a day, Ben Rogers says. Say, Becky, was you ever engaged? No. Would you like to? Well, I reckon so. I don't know. What's it like? Like? Well, it ain't like anything. You only just tell a boy you won't ever have anybody but him ever, ever, ever. Then you kiss and that's all. Anybody can do it. Becky hesitating, Tom took silence for consent and passed his arm around her waist. And then he kissed her. Now we're engaged, Becky. And always after this, you know you ain't ever to love anybody but me. And you ain't ever to marry anybody but me, never, never, and forever. Will you? Yes, Tom, and you ain't to ever marry anybody but me either. Certainly, of course, that's part of it. And always coming to school or when we're going home, you're to walk with me when there ain't nobody looking. And you choose me and I choose you at parties. Oh, it's ever so jolly. Why, me and Amy Lawrence... All oh, the big eyes told Tom his blunder, and he stopped, confused. Oh, Tom, then I ain't the first you ever been engaged to. And Becky began to cry. Oh, Becky, I don't care for her anymore. Yes, you do, Tom, you know you do. Becky, won't you say something? More sobs. Tom got out his chiefest jewel, a brass knob from the top of an iron barn, and said, Becky, please, won't you take it? She struck it to the floor. Then Tom marched out of the house, over the hills, and far away to return to school no more that day. Presently, Becky began to suspect. She ran to the door, but he was not in sight, and then she called, Tom! Tom! Come back, Tom! She listened intently, but there was no answer. She had no companions but silence and loneliness, and by this time, the scholars began to gather again, and she had to hide her grief. Tom dodged hither and thither through lanes until he was well out of the track of the returning scholars and then fell into a moody jog. Half an hour later, he was on the summit of Cardiff Hill, and the schoolhouse was hardly distinguishable in the valley behind him. He entered a dense wood and sat down under a spreading oak where the dead noonday heat had even stilled the songs of the birds. Tom sat long, his elbows on his knees, and his chin in his hands, meditating. It seemed to him that life was but trouble at best, and he more than half envied Jimmy Hodges, so lately released. It must be very peaceful, he thought, to lie and slumber and dream forever, and nothing to bother and grieve about. If only he had a clean Sunday school record, he could be willing to go and be done with it all. Now as to this girl, what had he done? Nothing. He had meant the best in the world and been treated like a dog, like a very dog. She'd be sorry someday, maybe when it was too late. Oh, if he could only die temporarily. That night, Tom lay awake and listened in restless impatience. The stairs creaked faintly. A measured muffled snore issued from Aunt Polly's chamber. Next, the ghastly ticking of a death watch in the wall at the bed's head made Tom shudder. It meant that somebody's days were numbered. At last, he began to doze in spite of himself. The clock chimed eleven, but he didn't hear it. And then there came, mingling with his half-formed dreams, a most melancholy caterwauling. 
The raising of a neighboring window disturbed him. A cry of scat, you devil, and the crash of an empty bottle against the back of his aunt's woodshed brought him wide awake. And a single minute later, he was dressed and out of the window and creeping along the roof on all fours. He meowed with caution once or twice as he went, then jumped to the roof of the woodshed and thence to the ground. Huckleberry Finn was there with his dead cat, and the boys moved off and disappeared into the gloom. At the end of a half an hour, they were wading through the tall grass of the graveyard. It was a graveyard of the old-fashioned western kind. Grass and weeds grew rank over the whole cemetery. All the old graves were sunken in and round-topped. Worm-eaten boards staggered, leaning for support and finding none. A faint wind moaned through the trees. The boys talked little and only under their breath. Then found the sharp new heap they were seeking and ensconced themselves within the protection of three great elms within a few feet of the grave. Then they waited in silence for what seemed a long time. At last, Tom's reflections grew oppressive. He must force some talk, so he whispered, Hucky, do you believe the dead people like it for us to be here? I wish I knowed. It's awful solemn-like, ain't it? Say, Hucky, do you reckon Hoss Williams hears us talking? Of course he does. At least his spirit does. Gee, I wish I'd said Mr. Williams. But I never meant any harm. Everybody calls him Hoss. Well, a body can't be too particular how they talk about these here dead people, Tom. This was a damper, and conversation died again. Presently, Tom seized his comrade's arm and said, Shh. What is it, Tom? And the two clung together with beating hearts. Shh. There it is again. Didn't you hear it? I... Oh, Lord, Tom, they're coming. They're coming, Sure. What do we do? I don't know. You think they'll see us? Oh, Tom, they can see in the dark, same as cats. I wish I hadn't come. Oh, don't be afraid. I don't believe they'll bother us. We ain't doing any harm. If we keep perfectly still, maybe they won't notice us at all. Listen. The boys bent their heads together and scarcely breathed. A muffled sound of voices floated up from the far end of the graveyard. Look, whispered Tom. What is it? Some vague figures approached through the gloom, swinging an old-fashioned tin lantern. Presently, Huckleberry whispered with a shudder, It's the devil, sure enough, three of them. Lordy, Tom, we're goners. Can you pray? I'll try, but don't you be afraid. They ain't gonna hurt us. Now I lay me down to sleep, I... Shh. What is it, Huck? They're humans. One of them is anyway. One of them's old Muff Potter's voice. Drunk, same as usual, likely blamed old Rip. Say, Huck, I know another of them voices. It's Injun Joe. That's so. That's right. That murder and half-breed. Oh, I'd rather they was devils at Dern sight. What can they be up to? The whispers died wholly out now for the three men had reached the grave and stood within a few feet of the boy's hiding place. Here it is, said the third voice, and the owner of it held the lantern up and revealed the face of young Dr. Robinson. Potter and Indian Joe were carrying a hand barrel with a rope and a couple of shovels on it. They cast down their load and they began to open the grave. The doctor put the lantern at the head of the grave and came and sat down with his back against one of the elm trees. He was so close the boys could have touched him. Hurry, men, he said in a low voice. That moon might come out at any minute. They growled a response, and they went on digging. For some time now, there was no noise but the grating sound of the spades discharging their freight of mold and gravel. Finally, a spade struck upon the coffin with a dull, woody accent, and within another minute or two, the men had hoisted it out on the ground. They prized off the lid with their shovels, got out the body, and dumped it rudely on the ground. The moon drifted from behind the clouds and exposed the pallid face. The barrow was got ready and the corpse placed on it and covered with a blanket. Now the custard thing's done, Sawbones, and you're just out with another five, or here she stays. That's the talk, said Injun Joe. Now look at here, what does this mean, said the doctor. You required your pay in advance and I've paid you. Yes, and you've done more than that, said Injun Joe. 
You drove me away from your father's kitchen one night when I come to ask you for something to eat. You said I wasn't there for any good, and when I swore I'd get even with you, even if it took a hundred years, your father had me jailed as a vagrant. Did you think I'd forgot? The engine blood ain't in me for nothing. And now I got you, and you gotta settle. He was threatening the doctor with his fist in his face by this time, and the doctor struck out suddenly and stretched the ruffian on the ground. Potter dropped his knife and exclaimed, Here now, don't you strike my part. And the next moment he had grappled with the doctor, and the two were struggling with might and main, trampling the grass and tearing the ground with their heels. Injun Joe sprang to his feet, his eyes flaming, snatched up Potter's knife, went creeping cat-like round and round the combatants, seeking an opportunity. All at once the doctor flung himself free, seized the heavy headboard of William's grave, and fell Potter to the earth with it. And in the same instant, the half-breed saw his chance, drove the knife to the hilt in the young man's breast. He reeled and fell partly upon Potter, flooding him with his blood, and in the same moment, the clouds blotted out the dreadful spectacle, and the two frightened boys went speeding away in the dark. Presently, when the moon emerged again, Injun Joe was standing over the two forms, contemplating them. The doctor murmured inarticulately, gave a long gasp or two, and was still. The half-breed muttered, That score is settled, damn you. And then he robbed the body, after which he put the fatal knife in Potter's open right hand and sat down on the dismantled coffin. Three, four, five minutes passed, and then Potter began to stir and moan. His hand closed upon the knife. He raised it, glanced at it, and let it fall with a shudder. Then he sat up, pushing the body from him, and gazed at it, and then around him confusedly. His eyes met Joe's. Lord, how is this, Joe, he said. It's a dirty business, said Joe, without moving. What did you do it for? I, I never done it. Oh, now, look here, that kind of talk won't wash. Potter trembled and grew white. Tell me honest now, old fella. Did I do it, Joe? I never meant to. I never meant to, Joe. Tell me how it was. Why, you two were scuffling, and he fetched you with one with a headboard, and you fell flat. And then up you come and snatched the knife, and you jammed it into him just as he fetched you another awful clip. And there you've laid, dead as a wedge till now. Oh, I didn't know what I was doing. It was all on account of the whiskey and the excitement, I reckon. I never used a weapon in my life before, Joe. I fought, but never with weapons. They'll all say that. Joe, don't tell. You won't tell. Will you, Joe? And the poor creature dropped on his knees before the stolid murderer and clasped his appealing hands. No, you've always been fair and square with me, Moff Potter, and I won't go back on you. Oh, Joe, I'll bless you for this the longest day I live. And Potter began to cry. Oh, come now, that's enough of that. This ain't any time for blubbering. You be off yonder way and I'll go this. Move now and don't leave any tracks behind you. Potter started on a trot that quickly increased to a run. The half-breed stood looking after him, he muttered. If he's as much stunned with the lick and fuddled with the rum as he had the look of being... He won't think of the knife till he's gone so far he'll be afraid to come back after it to such a place by himself. Chicken heart. Two or three minutes later, the murdered man, the blanketed corpse, the lidless coffin, and the open grave were under no inspection but the moon's. The stillness was complete again, too. The two boys fled on and on toward the village, speechless with horror. Well, if we can only get to the old tannery before we break down, whispered Tom in short catches between breaths. I can't stand it much longer. Huckleberry's hard pantings were his only reply. At last, they burst through the open door of the tannery and fell grateful and exhausted in the sheltering shadows beyond. Tom whispered, Huckleberry, what do you reckon will come of this? Well, if Dr. Robinson dies, I reckon hanging will come of it. Tom thought a while, then he said... Who'll tell? We? What are you talking about? Suppose something happened and Injun Joe didn't hang. Why, he'd kill us sometime or other, just as dead sure as we're lying here. That's just what I was thinking to myself, Huck. If anybody tells, let Muff Potter do it. Tom said nothing but went on thinking. Presently he whispered, Huck, Muff Potter don't know it. How can he tell? What's the reason he don't know it? 
Because he just got that whack when Injun Joe done it. You reckon he could see anything? By hokey, that's so, Tom. After another reflective silence, Tom said, Hucky, you sure you can keep Mom? Tom, we got to keep Mom. You know that. That engine devil wouldn't make any more of drowning us than a couple of cats if we was to squeak about this and they didn't hang him. Now, look at here, Tom. Let's swear to keep Mom. I'm a great, Huck. It's the best thing. Would you just hold hands and swear that we... Oh, no, no. That wouldn't do for this. That's good enough for little rubbishy comet things, you know, especially with gals, because they, they go back on you anyway and blab if they get in a huff. But there ought to be writing about a big thing like this. And blood. Tom's whole being applauded the idea. It was deep and dark and awful. The hour, the circumstances, the surroundings were in keeping with it. He picked up a clean pine shingle that lay in the moonlight, took a little fragment of red keel out of his pocket, got the moon on his work, and painfully scrawled these lines. Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer swear they will keep Mum about this, and they wish they may drop down dead in their tracks if they ever tell and rot. Huckleberry was filled with admiration of Tom's facility in writing and the sublimity of his language. Then each boy pricked the ball of his thumb and squeezed out a drop of blood. In time, after many squeezes, Tom managed to sign his initials using the ball of his little finger for a pen. And then he showed Huckleberry how to make an H and an F. The oath was complete, and they buried the shingle close to the wall with some dismal ceremonies and incantations. Then they separated, cogitating deeply on the events of the night. When Tom crept in at his bedroom window, the night was almost spent. He undressed with excessive caution, and soon he fell asleep congratulating himself that nobody knew of his escapade. Close upon the hour of noon, the whole village was suddenly electrified with the ghastly news. No need of the yet undreamed-up telegraph. The tale flew from man to man, from group to group, from house to house, with little less than telegraphic speed. Of course, the schoolmaster gave holiday for that afternoon. The town would have thought strangely of him if he had not. A gory knife had been found close to the murdered man, and it had been recognized by somebody as belonging to Muff Potter. So the story ran. All the town was drifting toward the graveyard. Tom joined the procession. Not because he would not a thousand times rather go anywhere else, but because an awful, unaccountable fascination drew him on. Arrived at the dreadful place, he wormed his small body through the crowd. Somebody pinched his arm. He turned and his eyes met Huckleberry's. They both looked elsewhere at once and wondered if anybody had noticed anything in their mutual glance. But everybody was talking and intent upon the grisly spectacle before them. Now Tom shivered from head to heel, for his eyes fell upon the stolid face of Injun Joe. At this moment, the crowd began to sway and struggle, and voices shouted, It's him! It's him! It's Muff Potter! He's coming! Hello! He stopped! Look out, he's turning. Don't let him get away. People in the branches of the trees over Tom's head said he wasn't trying to get away. He only looked doubtful and perplexed. The crowd fell apart now, and the sheriff came through ostentatiously, leading Potter by the arm. The poor fellow's face was haggard. When he stood before the murdered man, he shook as with palsy. And he put his face in his hands and burst into tears. I didn't do it, friends, he sobbed. Upon my word and honor, I never done it. Who's accused you, shouted a voice. This shot seemed to carry home. Potter lifted his face and looked around him with a pathetic hopelessness in his eyes. He saw Injun Joe and exclaimed, Oh, Injun Joe, you, you promised me you'd never... Is that your knife? And it was thrust before him by the sheriff. Potter shuddered, and then he waved his nerveless hand with a vanquished gesture and said, Tell him, Joe, tell him. It ain't any use anymore. Then Huckleberry and Tom heard the stony-hearted liar reel off his serene statement. They expecting every moment that the clear sky would deliver God's lightning upon his head and wondered to see how long the stroke was delayed. Injun Joe repeated his statement just as calmly, 
a few minutes afterwards on the inquest under oath. And the boys, seeing that the lightnings were still withheld, were confirmed in their belief that Joe had sold himself to the devil. Tom's fearful secret and gnawing conscience disturbed his sleep for as much as a week after this. His distress wore off gradually, but it seemed that his schoolmates never would get done holding inquests on dead cats and thus keeping his trouble present in his mind. However, even inquests went out of vogue at last and ceased to torture Tom's conscience. Every day or two, Tom watched his opportunity, and he went to the little grated jail window and smuggled such small comforts through to the accused man, such things as he could get hold of. These offerings helped to ease Tom's conscience. The villagers had a strong desire to tar and feather engine Joe for body snatching, but so formidable was his character that nobody could be found who was willing to take the lead in the matter, so it was dropped. <music> Becky Thatcher had stopped coming to school. She was ill. What if she should die? There was distraction in the thought. He no longer took an interest in war, nor even in piracy. He put his hoop away in his bat. There was no joy in them anymore. His aunt was concerned, and she began to try all manner of medicines on him. She was one of those people who were infatuated with patent medicines and all newfangled methods of producing health or mending it. Now she heard of painkiller for the first time, and she ordered a lot at once. She tasted it and was filled with gratitude. It was simply fire in a liquid form. She pinned her faith to painkiller, gave Tom a teaspoonful, and watched with deepest anxiety for the result. Tom thought over various plans for relief and finally hit upon that of professing to be fond of painkiller. He asked for it so often that he became a nuisance, and his aunt ended by telling him to help himself and quit bothering her. She found that the medicine did really diminish, but it did not occur to her that the boy was mending the health of a crack in the sitting room floor with it. One day Tom was in the act of dosing the crack when the ant's yellow cat came along, purring and eyeing the teaspoon avariciously, begging for a taste. Tom said, now don't ask for it unless you want it, Peter. But Peter signified that he did want it. You better make sure... Peter was sure. Now you've asked for it, and I'll give it to you, because there ain't anything mean about me. But if you don't like it, you mustn't blame anybody but your own self. Peter was agreeable, so Tom prized his mouth open and poured down the painkiller. <laughs> Peter sprang a couple of yards in the air and then delivered a war hoop and set off and round and round the room, banging against the furniture, upsetting flower pots and making general havoc. Next, he rose on his hind feet and began to prance around in a frenzy of enjoyment with his head over his shoulder and his voice proclaiming his unappeasable happiness. Then he went tearing around the house again, spreading chaos and destruction in his path. Aunt Polly entered in time to see him throw a few double somersaults, deliver a final mighty hurrah, and sail through the open window carrying the rest of the flower pots with him. The old lady stood petrified with astonishment, peering over her glasses. Tom lay on the floor, expiring with laughter. Tom, what on earth ails that cat? I don't know, Aunt, gasped the boy. Now, sir, what did you want to treat that poor dumb beast so for? I done it out of pity for him because he hadn't any aunt. Hadn't any aunt, you numbskull. What has that got to do with it? Heaps. Because if he'd have had one, she'd have had to burn him out herself. She'd have roasted his bowels out with painkiller. Without any more feeling than if he was a human. Aunt Polly felt a sudden pang of remorse. Now this was putting the thing in a new light. What was cruelty to a cat might be cruelty to a boy, too. She began to soften. She felt sorry. Her, her eyes watered a little, and she put her hand on Tom's head and said gently, I was meaning for the best, Tom. And, Tom, it did do you good. Tom looked up in her face with just a perceptible twinkle peeping through his gravity. I know you was meaning for the best, Annie, and so was I with Peter. It done him good, too. I never see him get around so nice. 
I'll go along with you, Tom, before you aggravate me again. Now, you try and see if you can't be a good boy for once, huh? And you didn't take any more medicine. Days passed, and Tom now reached school at regularly ahead of time. As usual of late, he hung about the gate of the schoolyard instead of playing with his comrades. Tom watched and watched, hoping whenever a frisking frock came in sight and hating the owner of it as soon as he saw that she was not the right one. And then at last, one more frock passed in at the gate, and Tom's heart gave a great bound. The next instant, he was out and going on like an Indian, yelling, chasing boys, jumping over the fence at risk of life and limb, throwing handsprings, doing all the heroic things he could conceive of, and keeping a furtive eye out all the while to see if Becky Thatcher was noticing. But she seemed to be unconscious of it all. She never looked. Could it be possible that she was not aware that he was there? He carried his exploits to her immediate vicinity, came war-whooping around, snatched a boy's cap, hurled it to the roof of the schoolhouse, broke through a group of boys and fell sprawling himself under Becky's nose, almost upsetting her. And she turned with her nose in the air, and he heard her say, hmm. Some people think they're mighty smart, always showing off. Tom's cheeks burned. He gathered himself up, sneaked off, crushed and crestfallen. By the time the bell for school to take up tinkled faintly upon his ear, Tom was far down Meadowland. Just at this point, he met his sworn comrade, Joe Harper. And Tom began to mutter something about a resolution to escape from hard usage and lack of sympathy at home by roaming abroad into the great world. But it transpired that this was a request which Joe had just been going to make of Tom and had come to hunt him up for that very purpose. His mother had equipped him for drinking some cream which he had never tasted and knew nothing about it. It was plain that she was tired of him and wished him to go. As the two boys walked sorrowing along, they made a new compact to stand by each other and be brothers and never separate till death relieves them of their troubles. And then they began to lay their plans. Now, Joe was for being a hermit and living on crusts in a remote cave and dying some time of cold and want and grief. But after listening to Tom, he conceded that there were some conspicuous advantages about a life of crime, and so he consented to be a pirate. Now, three miles below St. Petersburg, at a point where the Mississippi River was a trifle over a mile wide, there was a long, narrow, wooded island. It was not inhabited, and it lay far over toward the farther shore. So Jackson's Island was chosen. Then they hunted up Huckleberry Finn... Of course, he joined them promptly, for all careers were one to him. They presently separated to meet at a lonely spot at the riverbank two miles above the village at the favorite hour, which was midnight. There was a small log raft there which they meant to capture. Long about midnight, Tom arrived with a boiled ham and a few trifles. It was starlight and very still. The mighty river lay like an ocean at rest. Tom listened a moment and then gave a low, distinct whistle. It was answered from under the bluff. Then a guarded voice said, Who goes there? Tom Sawyer, the black avenger of the Spanish main. Name your names. Huck Finn, the red-handed, and Joe Harper, the terror of the seas. Tis well, give the countersign. Two hoarse whispers delivered the same awful words simultaneously to the brooding night. Blood. The terror of the seas had brought a side of bacon. Finn the red-handed had stolen a skillet and a quantity of half-cured leaf tobacco. But none of the pirates smoked or chewed but himself. The black avenger of the Spanish main said it would never do to start without some fire. That was a wise thought. Matches were hardly known in that day. They saw a fire smoldering upon a great raft a hundred yards above, and they went stealthily thither and helped themselves to a chunk. They shoved off presently on the small log raft. 
Tom stood amidships, gloomy browed and with folded arms, and gave his orders in a low, stern whisper. Luff, and bring her to the wind. Aye, aye, sir. Steady, steady. Steady it is, sir. Now the raft was passing before the distant town. Two or three glimmering lights showed where it lay, peacefully sleeping. Beyond the vague, vast sweep of star-gemmed water, unconscious of the tremendous event that was happening, the pirates were looking their last, and they all looked so long that they came near letting the current drift them out of the range of the island, but they discovered the danger in time. About two o'clock in the morning, the raft grounded on the bar above the head of the island, and they waded back and forth until they had landed their freight. Part of the little raft's belongings consisted of an old sail, and this they spread over a nook in the bushes for a tent to shelter their provisions. They built a fire against the side of a great log, and then cooked some bacon in the frying pan for supper, and used up half the corn pone stock they'd brought. It seemed glorious sport to be feasting in that wild freeway far from the haunts of men, and they said they would never return to civilization. When the last crisp slice of bacon was gone, and the last allowance of corn pone devoured, the boys stretched themselves out on the grass filled with contentment. Ain't it jolly, said Joe. Ah, oh, it's nuts, said Tom. What would the boys say if they could see us? Say, <laughs> well, they'd just die to be here. Hey, Hucky? I reckon so, said Huckleberry. Anyway, I'm suited. I don't want nothing better than this. It's just the life for me, said Tom. You don't have to get up mornings. You don't have to go to school and wash. All that blame foolishness. Gradually, their talk died out, and drowsiness began to steal upon their eyelids. The pipe dropped from the fingers of the red-handed, and he slept through the sleep of the conscience free and the weary. The terror of the seas and the black adventure of the Spanish main had more difficulty in getting to sleep. They began to feel a vague fear that they had been doing wrong to run away. And next, they thought of the stolen meat. They tried to argue it away by reminding Conscience that they had purloined sweet mates and apples scores of times. But it seemed to them in the end that there was no getting around the stubborn fact that taking sweet mates was only hooking, while taking bacon and ham and such valuables was plain, simple stealing. So they inwardly resolved that so long as they remained in the business, their piracies should not again be sullied with the crime of stealing. Their conscience granted the truce, and these curiously inconsistent pirates fell peacefully to sleep. When Tom awoke in the morning, he wondered where he was. He sat up, rubbed his eyes, looked around. It was the cool gray dawn, and there was a delicious sense of repose and peace in the deep silence of the woods. Beaded dewdrops stood upon the leaves and the grasses. A white layer of ashes covered the fire, and a thin blue wreath of smoke rose straight up into the air. Joe and Huck still slept. Gradually, the cool, dim gray of the morning whitened. The marvel of nature, shaking off sleep and going to work, unfolded itself to the musing boy. A little green worm came crawling over a dewy leaf, lifting two-thirds of his body into the air from time to time, sniffing around and then proceeding again. Now a procession of ants appeared from nowhere in particular and went about their labors. One struggled manfully by with a dead spider five times as big as itself in its arms and lugged it straight up a tree trunk. The birds were fairly rioting by this time. A catbird lit in a tree over Tom's head and trilled out her imitations of her neighbors. A shrill jay swept down a flash of blue flame, stopped on a twig almost within the boy's reach. And then a gray squirrel came scurrying along, sitting up at intervals to inspect and chatter at the boy. Long lances of sunlight pierced down through the dense foliage far and near, and a few butterflies came fluttering upon the scene. Tom stirred up the other pirates, and they all clattered away with a shout. And in a minute or two were stripped and chasing after each other in the shallow limpid water of the white sandbar. They came back to camp wonderfully refreshed, glad-hearted and ravenous. Huck found a spring of clear water close by, and they 
Boy made cups of broad oak leaves. Water sweetened with such a wildwood charm as that. Uh, it was a good enough substitute for coffee. And while Joe was slicing bacon for breakfast, Tom and Huck stepped to a promising nook in the riverbank and threw in their lines. Joe had not had time to get impatient before they were back again with some handsome bass and a couple of sun perch. They fried the fish with the bacon and they were astonished. For no fish had ever seemed so delicious before. After breakfast, they went off to the woods on a little exploring expedition. They tramped gaily along over decaying logs, through tangled underbrush, among solemn monarchs of the forest. They discovered that the island was about three miles long and a quarter of a mile wide. At the shore it lay closest to was only separated from it by a narrow channel 200 yards wide. They took a swim about every hour, so it was close upon the middle of the afternoon when they got back to camp. Uh, the talk soon began to drag and then died. The stillness, the solemnity that brooded in the woods and the sense of loneliness began to tell upon the spirits of the boys. They, they fell to thinking. A sort of an undefined longing crept over them. It was budding homesickness. Even Finn the red-handed was dreaming of his doorsteps and empty hogsheads. But they were all ashamed of their weakness, and none was brave enough to speak his thought. For some time now, the boys had been dully conscious of a peculiar sound in the distance. But now this mysterious sound became a little more pronounced. The boys started and glanced at each other, and then a deep, sullen boom came floating down out of the distance. What is it? exclaimed Joe under his breath. Taint thunder, said Huckleberry in an odd tone. Because thunder... Hark, said Tom, listen, don't talk. They waited a time that seemed an age, and then the same muffled boom troubled the solemn hush. Let's go and see. They sprang to their feet and hurried to the shore toward the town. They parted the bushes on the bank and peered out over the water. About a mile below the village, a little steam ferry boat was drifting with the current. Her broad deck was crowded with people. Presently, a great jet of white smoke burst from the ferry boat's side. The same dull throb of sound was borne on the listeners again. I know now, exclaimed Tom. Somebody's drowned. That's it, said Huck. They'd done that last summer when Bill Turner got drowned. They'd shoot a cannon over the water, and that makes him come up to the top. Why, jings, I wish I was over there now, said Joe. I do too, said Huck. I'd give heaps to know who it is. A revealing thought flashed through Tom's mind, and he exclaimed, Boys, I know who's drowned. It's us. They felt like heroes in an instant. Here was a gorgeous triumph. They were missed. They were mourned. Hearts were breaking on their account, and best of all, the departed were the talk of the whole town and the envy of all the boys. This was fine. It was worthwhile to be a pirate after all. As twilight drew on, the ferry boat went back to her accustomed business, and the skiffs disappeared. The pirates returned to camp. They were jubilant with vanity over their new grandeur and the illustrious trouble they were making. They cooked supper and ate it, and then fell to guessing at what the village was thinking and saying about them. But when the shadows of night closed them in, they gradually ceased to talk, and they sat gazing into the fire with their minds evidently wandering elsewhere. The excitement was gone now, and Tom and Joe couldn't keep back thoughts of certain persons at home who were not enjoying this fine frolic as much as they were. Then they gradually wandered apart, and dropped into the dumps, fell to gazing longingly across the wide river to where the village lay drowsing in the sun. Tom found himself riding Becky in the sand with his big toe. He scratched it out, and he was angry with himself for his weakness. But Joe's spirits had, uh, had gone down almost beyond resurrection. He was so homesick that he could hardly endure the misery of it. About midnight, Joe awoke, and he called the boys. There was a brooding oppressiveness in the air that seemed to bode something. The boys huddled themselves together. There was a pause. Now a weird flash turned night into day and showed every little grass blade separate and distinct. A deep peal of thunder went rolling and tumbling down the heavens. 
and an instant crash followed that seemed to rend the treetops right over the boys' heads. A few big raindrops fell pattering upon the leaves. Quick, boys, go for the tent, exclaimed Tom. A furious blast roared through the trees, making everything sing as it went. One blinding flash after another came. Peal on peal of deafening thunder. And now a drenching rain poured down, and the rising hurricane drove it in sheets along the ground. The tempest rose higher and higher, and presently the sail tore loose from its fastenings and went winging away on the blast. The boys fled to the shelter of a great oak that stood upon the riverbank. The storm culminated in one matchless effort that seemed likely to tear the island to pieces, burn it up, blow it away, and deafen every creature in it, all in one and the same moment. But at last the battle was done, and the forces retired with weaker and weaker threatenings and grumblings. The boys went back to camp a good deal awed and found that everything was drenched. They presently discovered the fire had eaten so far up under the great log that a hand breadth or so of it had escaped wetting. So they coaxed the fire to burn again. They then piled on great dead boughs until they had a roaring furnace. They dried their boiled ham and they had a feast, and after that they sat by the fire until morning. There wasn't a dry spot to sleep on anywhere around. As the sun began to steal in upon the boys, drowsiness came over them. And they went out on the sandbar, and they lay down to sleep, rusty, stiff-jointed, and a little homesick once more. Meanwhile, there was no hilarity in the little town that tranquil Saturday afternoon. The Harpers and Aunt Polly's family were in mourning with great grief and many tears. An unusual quiet possessed the village. The villagers conducted their concerns with an absent air, but they sighed often and the children had no heart in their sports. When the Sunday school hour was finished the next morning, the bell began to toll instead of ringing in the usual way. The villagers began to gather, loitering a moment in the vestibule to converse in whispers about the sad event. None could remember when the little church had been so full before. There was finally a waiting pause, and then Aunt Polly entered, followed by the Harper family, all in deep black. And the whole congregation rose reverently and stood until the mourners were seated in the front pew. There was another communing silence, broken at intervals by muffled sobs, and then the minister spread his hands and prayed. As the service proceeded, the clergyman drew such pictures of the graces, the winning ways, and the rare promise of the lost lads that every soul there felt a pang in remembering that he had persistently blinded himself to them before and had seen only faults and flaws in the poor boys. The minister related many a touching incident in the lives of the departed, and the people could easily see now how noble and beautiful those episodes were, and they remembered with grief that at the time these had seemed rank rascalities, well deserving of the cowhide. At last the whole company broke down and joined the weeping mourners in a chorus of anguished sobs. A moment later, the church door creaked. The minister raised his streaming eyes above his handkerchief and stood transfixed. First one, and then another pair of eyes followed the minister's, and then, almost with one impulse, the congregation rose and stared while the three dead boys came marching up the aisle. Tom in the lead, Joe next, and Huck, a ruin of drooping rags, sneaking sheepishly in the rear. Aunt Polly and the Harpers threw themselves upon their restored ones, smothered them with kisses, and poured out thanksgivings, while poor Huck stood abashed and uncomfortable, not knowing exactly what to do or where to hide. He wavered and started to slink away, but Tom seized him and said, Aunt Polly, it ain't fair. Somebody's got to be glad to see Huck. 
And so they shall. I'm glad to see him, the poor motherless thing. And the loving attentions Aunt Polly lavished upon him were the one thing capable of making him even more uncomfortable than he was before. Suddenly the minister shouted at the top of his voice, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Sing and put your hearts into it. Old hundred swelled with a triumphant burst, and while it shook the rafters, Tom Sawyer, the pirate, looked around, looked around upon the envying juveniles about him and confessed in his heart that this was the proudest moment of his life. As the congregation trooped out, they said they would be almost willing to be made ridiculous again to hear old hundred sung like that once more. What a hero Tom was to become now. He did not go skipping and prancing, but he moved with a dignified swagger, as became a pirate who felt that the public eye was on him, and indeed it was. Smaller boys than himself flopped at his heels. Boys of his own size pretended not to know he had been away at all, but they were consumed with envy nevertheless. They would have given anything to have that swarthy, sun-tanned skin of his and his glittery notoriety. And Tom wouldn't have parted with either for a circus. At school, the children made so much of him and Joe that the two heroes were not long in becoming insufferably stuck up. Tom decided that he could be independent of Becky Thatcher now. Glory was sufficient. He would live for glory. Presently, she arrived. Tom pretended not to see her. He moved away and joined a group of boys and girls and began to talk. Soon he observes that she was tripping gaily back and forth with flushed face and dancing eyes, pretending to be busy chasing schoolmates and screaming with laughter when she had made a capture. But he noticed that she always made her captures in his vicinity and that she seemed to cast a conscious eye in his direction at such times, too. It gratified all the vanity that was in him, and so, instead of winning him, made him the more diligent to avoid betraying that he knew she was about. Presently, she gave over skylarking, and she moved irresolutely about, sighing once or twice and glancing furtively and wistfully towards Tom. Then she observed that Tom was talking more particularly to Amy Lawrence than to anyone else. She felt a sharp pang, and she grew disturbed and uneasy at once. She tried to go away, but her feet were treacherous and carried her to the group instead. She said to a girl almost at Tom's elbow with sham vivacity, my ma's going to let me have a picnic. Oh, won't it be fun? You're going to have all the girls and boys? Oh, yes, everyone that's friends to me or wants to be. And she glanced ever so furtively at Tom. But he talked right along to Amy Lawrence about the terrible storm on the island. Oh, may I come, said Gracie Miller. Yes. And me, said Sally Rogers. Yes. And me, too, said Susie Harper and Joe. Yes. And so on until all the group had begged for invitations but Tom and Amy. Then Tom turned coolly away, still talking, and took Amy with him. Becky's lips trembled and the tears came to her eyes. She hid these signs and went on chattering, but the life had gone out of the picnic now. She got away as soon as she could and she had a good cry. And then she sat moody with wounded pride till the bell rang. She roused up now with a vindictive cast in her eye gave her plated tails a shake, and said she knew what she'd do. At recess, Tom continued his flirtation with Amy, and he kept drifting about to find Becky and lacerate her with the performance. At last he spied her, but there was a sudden falling of his mercury. She was sitting cozily on a little bench, looking at a picture book with Alfred Temple, and so absorbed were they, and their heads were so close together that did not seem to be conscious of anything in the whole world besides. Jealousy ran red-hot through Tom's veins. He began to hate himself for throwing away the chance Becky had offered. Amy chattered happily along as they walked, but Tom's tongue had lost its function, and Amy's happy prattle became intolerable. The girl chirped on. Tom thought, Oh, hang her, ain't I ever going to get rid of her? At last, he hastened away. Any other boy, thought Tom, gritting his teeth. Any boy in the whole town but that St. Louis smarty thinks he dresses so fine. All right, I licked you the first day you ever saw this town, mister. 
and I'll lick you again. And he went through the motions of thrashing an imaginary boy, pummeling the air and kicking and gouging. Meanwhile, Becky resumed her picture inspections with Alfred, but as the minutes dragged along and no Tom came along to suffer, her triumph began to cloud and she lost interest. At last, she got up and walked away. Alfred dropped alongside, but she said, Go away and leave me alone, can't you? I hate you. So the boy halted, wondering what he could have done, and then went musing into the deserted schoolhouse. He easily guessed his way to the truth. The girl had simply made a convenience of him to vent her spite upon Tom Sawyer. He wished there was some way to get that boy into trouble without much risk to himself. Tom's spelling book fell under his eye. Here was his opportunity. He gratefully opened it to the lesson for the afternoon and poured ink upon the page. Becky, glancing in at a window behind him at the moment, saw the act and moved on. She started homeward now, intending to find Tom and tell him, but before she was halfway home, however, she had changed her mind. The thought of Tom's treatment of her when she was talking about her pectic filled her with shame. She resolved to let him get whipped on the damaged spelling book's account and to hate him forever into the bargain. Poor Becky, she didn't know how fast she was nearing trouble herself. The master, Mr. Dobbins, had reached middle age with an unsatisfied ambition to be a doctor. But poverty had decreed that he should be nothing higher than a village schoolmaster. Every day he took a mysterious book out of his desk and absorbed himself in it at times when no classes were reciting. He kept that book under lock and key. There was not an urchin in school, but was perishing to have a glimpse of it. Now, as Becky was passing by the desk, which stood near the door, she noticed that the key was in the lock. She glanced around, found herself alone, and the next instant she had the book in her hands. The title page, Professor Somebody's Anatomy, carried no information to her mind, so she began to turn the leaves. She came at once upon a handsomely engraved and colored frontispiece of a human figure, stark naked. At that moment, a shadow fell on the page, and Tom Sawyer stepped in at the door and caught a glimpse of the picture. Becky snatched at the book to close it and had the hard luck to tear the pictured page half down the middle. She thrust the volume into the desk, turned the key, and burst out crying with shame and vexation. Tom Sawyer, you're just as mean as you can be to sneak up on a person and look at what they're looking at. Well, how could I know you was looking at anything? You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Tom Sawyer. You know you're going to tell on me, and I'll be whipped... And I never was whipped in school. She stamped her foot and said, Be so mean if you want to. I know something that's going to happen. You just wait and you'll see. Hateful, hateful. And she flung out of the house with a new explosion of crying. Tom stood still, rather flustered by this onslaught. Presently, he said to himself, Never been licked at school? Shucks, what's a licking? That's just like a girl. Of course, I ain't going to tell old Dobbins, but what of it? Old Dobbins will ask who it was Tory's book, and nobody will answer. Then he'll do just the way he always does. He'll ask first one, then a t'other, and when he comes to the right girl, he'll know it without any telling. Well, it's kind of a tight place for Becky Thatcher, because there ain't any way out of it. Tom conned the thing a moment longer and then added, all right, though. She'd like to see me in just such a fix. Let her sweat it out. Ha, ha, ha.